Yo, man. So once again, how do you guys with the camp? Yo, how many of you guys can say, man, that Jesus touched my life and it was changed forever, man? Yo, girl, you got messed up. <laughs> she got messed up, man. Um, man, like, I just, th- there was just so many amazing, like, holy moments at camp. Like, like every night was so impactful, and I'm going to get into that. And, and the message, man, but I want you guys, though, to hear how God changed your guys' lives. Um, as far as, like, from student to student. So if Severson, where's a Sever? Where is, where's, where's my boy at Severson? Where's he at? Severson. C- c- come on up, man. So, man, so something that we um, did uh, is, is we had everybody write out their testimonies, man. And we read his testimony. We were like, dude, he has to share because it's so amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and share it and turn it over to you and go for it, man. Hi there, first off. And... I would like to say that God touched me because he, I had a long, strong battle with anger and a lack of trust growing up from probably the age seven because a lot of family issues started to happen at that age and I started to grow a lot of hatred and anger right to the point where I just started to had turn my back on God and by shunned her. And then something happened where I came to the camp and they gave the shout out to the people who were battling with anger. And I, thank you, had, God gave me that, that feeling and he told me, go up there. And I listened and they prayed for me and I got slain in the spirit and it was probably the first time that I've ever been slain in the spirit and felt God that close to me firsthand. And it was probably one of the best experiences of my life. And I felt, and through the camp, the experience that I also got was he gave me the reassurance that he loved me through all the problems and all the sins and all the things that I went through. through And even turning my back on him, he still had all of his love towards me and all of us. And he never turned my back on me even when I did with him. Come on. Through all the habits that I formed and all the the frustration and anger and basically doing everything wrong, he finally, I finally felt that reassurance that I was loved and the people around me loved me as well as much as I did them. And I also would like to thank everyone in here and everyone that was at the camp. Him. You guys helped me a lot. A lot of people help, helped me and prayed for me you through all my struggles. And I just would like to thank you all, all very much. Awesome. Give it up for Timothy. Hey, really quick, really quick, before you uh, go back down. And so you said before camp, man, you had a lot of anger and frustration, you know, even bitterness and some hatred, right? Is it gone now? Completely. Completely gone. Completely. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Where's um, where's the Michaela Pierce at? Michaela Pierce. C- c- come on up, girl. Here's, here's another amazing testimony. We, we, we got three of these. This is number two. Hi. I'm Michaela. So, <laughs> okay. So, I have kind of the same story as Trinity. You know, just, um, I was adopted at the age of five. And, you know, the same thing happened with me. I just kind of had a lot of anger be- towards my original like my biological parents because, you know, I was wondering why didn't they want me, you know, why wasn't I good enough for them? And, um, you know, um, just, you know, struggling with all that anger inside of me, I kind of took it out on my parents, you know. I was always arguing with them and, you know, I was always getting upset at them for things that they didn't even do, you know, because I was afraid that maybe they were going to hurt me the same way that my original parents hurt me. And so I did the same thing as him. I turned my back on God in about seventh grade because, I don't know, just the pressures of life started to get to me and peer pressure. And, you know, as Sam put it this way on Sunday, life just started hitting me like a wrecking ball. And it destroyed me on the inside. It destroyed who I was inside. And so I came to camp, you know, not wanting, just not expecting anything because I didn't believe anymore. And so the first night I didn't really get into worship. 
But then the second night, I just felt something inside of me say, you need to open up. You need to open your heart up. You know, it doesn't matter how long you've closed it off for, you need to open your heart up. And so I opened my heart up and Pastor Israel prayed for the people who were just have, struggling in their lives, struggling with who they were and struggling with their life and struggling with the mistakes and who was going back to something that wasn't exactly, you know, ideal. And I just fell out on the floor sobbing because that was that was exactly that was exactly what I was going through. I just I don't know, I just it was just <laughs> I just felt it so hard and it just it really hurt and so I needed to cry. I needed to get all that emotion out so that God could have his way with me. And night three comes around and this time I, I go in wanting what God has for me. I go in expecting what God has for me. And after Pastor Israel, you know, preached and stuff, and we went back into worship again, I fell out in spirit. And I just felt this incredible peace come over me, and God saying to me that, you know, everything was going to be okay. You know, that he was there through all of the struggles and all of the pain and all of the hurt and all of the anger, and that he was there for me and that everything was going to be all right, that he had this perfect plan. And that's when, you know, I found myself again. And that's when I made my decision that I was not going to fall away anymore, that I was going to I was going to go after God with a new fire. And so I made the, the decision to get baptized again. And I did. And yeah, that's my story. Awesome. Now, hold on. I want you to stay up here, too, for a second. Is it OK if I kind of tell on you a little bit? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of tell on you a little bit. Um, so. So, 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 but before camp, what you just said is that you were like, man, like, I don't even really believe in God anymore, right? Yeah. That's basically where you were at. And then I love it. You said, man, at camp, God touched me. He changed me, man. He moved in my life. Then after camp, this, this is what I heard. You can tell me if um, I'm wrong. Basically, when you, when you got home, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to go to bed or whatever. Um, and so your parents come up to your room hours later, and they come, 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 come in your room. And what had you been doing for hours? Um, well, I had actually asked my mom if I could play Minecraft until, you know, I, <laughs> I really like Minecraft. Um, and so I asked mom if I could play Minecraft, and she was like, yeah, you just have to turn it off at midnight, you know, don't go to bed at a late hour. And, you know, I thought about it, and I was like, playing Minecraft, and I played Minecraft for about 15 minutes, and then I thought about it, I was like, you know, why don't I go read my Bible, and I go, you know, study the Word. And so I put the computer away, I shut it down, and I went to my room, and I pulled out my notebook, and I pulled out my Bible, and I just started reading, um, one of my cabin leaders, Rachel, she had told us to start reading in John, so I started reading in John. And what I did was I wrote the verse down, and then I wrote what the interpretation of the verse to me was. And mom walks in, and she was like, she was just kind of shocked. She was like, you're reading your Bible. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And she was like, wow. And she, like, started crying and stuff. She was like, oh, wow, camp really did change you. <laughs> so, yeah. That's Come on, issue. Jesus. Come on, give it up for Jesus. All right, where, where is Miss Raven at? Miss Raven, Raven, Raven. Come on up, girl. Somebody give it up for Raven. <laughs> Hey, hey! you know Jesus has a big destiny for you, right? You know that, right? Get it, girl. All right, so um, two weeks before Camp Destiny, I had a volleyball camp and kept Camp Destiny the same week, and I had to make a decision to go between volleyball camp or Camp Destiny, and they both cost the same price. Um, my parents were willing to do whatever... Um, they, like whatever I wanted to do. My dad was thinking one thing and my mom was thinking another. And I know that at the school I was going to, that they have favorites on the teams and that if I wanted to make it, I would need to go. And so the next morning I woke up and I just felt something on my heart just saying, you need to go to camp and that like God has my back and not to worry about that. And so um, I trusted him, went to camp Long story short, um, I had tryouts Monday and Tuesday, and I found out yesterday afternoon that I did make the team. And and so that just really showed me, like, wow, you need you trust God in everything that you do. And then uh, also before camp, I was feeling, like, really down, depressed, and felt like, you know, what's the point of life? What's my purpose? And, like, um, am I even noticed or, like, why am I existing right now, whatever. And so during the first night of worship at camp, 
um, I met, I, me and Pastor Israel got, made eye contact, and I was like, that was really weird, and so, um, I, in the back of my head, God's like, just telling me, I'm about to show you that you're noticed, and that I love you, and all this stuff, so, we're all sitting down, taking our notebooks out, and our Bible was ready to take notes, and he comes to my section, and he's like, there was someone over here, um, and the, he was just driving my shirt, and he called me up in front of everybody, and if you can't tell, I don't like being in front of people, <laughs> and so, um, he called me up in front of everybody, and he made me, like, show an example with basically what I was going through, holding pain everywhere I went, and, like, to just let it go, and I was like, wow, I am really noticed, and it really touched my heart that, like, God loves me, there's a purpose for me, we're not here on accident, whatever God does is for a reason, um, it's nothing's on accident god knows what he's doing and it just like really touched my heart and the first night i came i could not sleep at all and i because i was just so amazed that like wow you you really did do what you're going to do and then also um previous like weeks previous school years a lot of my friends girl and guy friends they're all been these like relationships with guys and girls and they're always coming to me with their problems and I was always the third will and I mean they go to the movies and I'd be sitting away from them because you know and so they're always coming to me with their problems and then um during the school year I wasn't really on track with God and they're like how come you're not in a relationship with God and I was just thinking well if I'm if my relationship's not right with God how am I supposed to be in a relationship with a man if it's not right with God and um so <laughs> Um, so, um, they'd always come to me with their problems, and I'm not good at solving problems, really, so, um, um, like, I told him that I'd pray for them or whatever, and all this stuff, and I remember one year in school, this boy had said something really rude, like I was ugly or something, and I was really hurt by it, and at the end of the day, at camp, I learned that I'm God's masterpiece, and I don't need to worry about what someone thinks about me. And so... Um, I started really thinking, like, you know, God made me, he didn't, you know, and so next time I know someone comes with a negative comment, all I have to say is, I'm God's masterpiece, it doesn't really matter, you know, what you think, and overall, I had a great experience, um, I didn't want to leave, as soon as my sister picked me up, and we were driving away, I started crying, and she was like, what's wrong, and I was just like, nothing, and she was like, well, you're not just crying for any reason, and then I told her I wasn't just, I wasn't ready to go, and she was like, that's exactly how she felt when she went to camp and all this stuff and how it changed her life. And overall, I just learned that, you know, I'm not here by accident. Um, I'm here for a reason. And all these struggles I go through that God's going to, like, um, push me through, even if it takes time and courage and effort. And God knows what he's doing. And I learned that we need to let go and let God and stop holding on to things because, like, God has our back. And overall, it was a great experience. If you didn't go, I recommend you go next year and, like, do whatever you need to do to come. And, yeah, that was my experience. Woo! That's awesome, girl. Thank you, Raven, much. So if you didn't go to camp, this thing's for you. I'm so sorry. I'm just kidding with you. I'm just kidding with you. So really quick, man, we're going to pray, and then I, I, I want to dive into um, – a new series tonight. It's kind of geared for people that went to camp, but if you didn't go to camp, you can get something from it too. So, Jesus, tonight we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your word, God. Wow, Jesus, God, you're so stinking amazing. Oh my goodness, God, just hearing all those testimonies it just gets me so excited, God. So, Father, but we thank you, God, that the best is yet to come. I mean, if everyone can lift their hands in the air for me and say, Jesus, tonight, speak to me change me in the name of jesus amen you can, can i be real with you guys you know what i always thought was weird and it's so kind of weird to me how like when we say jesus like we pray to jesus right but then when we pray in the name of jesus like it just kind of trips me out a little bit still so, i mean it's biblical but it trips me out a little bit i'm always like jesus thank you in jesus name wait aren't, i was just talking to you we're just through a person. Anyways, somebody say, what now? Somebody say, what now? Somebody say, what now? Man, if I could describe camp to you guys in one word, it would be the word heavy. Somebody say heavy. Somebody say heavy. 
I mean, literally, guys, from like the go, I, I mean, from like the second of five, four, three, two, one countdown was over. I mean, everybody was like, we're going after Jesus. And man, I don't care who's around me. I mean, I'm going to get all of Jesus I can get, baby. And it was like, woo, okay. You know, I was like, let's do this thing. You know what I mean? Um, and, and Jesus just showed up. And I remember the first night, Pastor Israel preached this sermon called Drop It Like It's Hot. Somebody say, drop it like it's hot. And, and he talked about a woman in the Bible um, who, who had a millstone. And she climbed up this tower because there is this king sieging the city, man. He, he was just destroying everything in, the, in, everything in his past. And she took this millstone and she dropped it on his head and she killed him. Um, and, and basically that millstone, y'all, the Bible is intense, man, real talk. Um, and, and that millstone, it represented, man, the pain that we have and the sin that we have and how God wants to take your pain and your sin and the weight of it and how he wants to use it as a weapon to take out the enemy. Right? Right? I, I mean, you guys remember that. And, and, and just that night, man, like... It was so epic, dude. This is like the altar call. Last second, man, we, we had to go run and grab boulders um, or whatever. And, and I just remember is that these kids came and grabbed these boulders as an altar call of their pain. The, the, the boulder was the representation of their pain. And they went outside, man, and, and, and they took that rock and they hurled it as they gave their pain to Jesus. And, and, and I was kind of telling kids, right, you can go. All right, hold on, wait to go outside. Okay, you can go now. And I remember when I walked outside. Man, you just walked outside. And like I said, it was a holy moment. Man, you just saw kids get on stage, like 30, 40 kids, just on their knees, all of them weeping before God. Weeping before God because of the release of pain. And because now the weight was gone. Heavy moments. Somebody say Heavy. Remember night number two. Man, Pastor Israel talked about being intentionally random. Being intentionally random. You know, about how we look at people with these amazing relationships with God. And we go, man, I wish I had that. And we just expect, you know, wake up one day and have this amazing relationship with God. But it just doesn't happen, right? It, it just doesn't happen. So you have to be intentional about it. And the altar call really had nothing to do with the sermon for me. I was like... That was out of the blue, but it was so good. Um, and that night, man, we um, released anger. He, he said, he said, he looked at me, he said, Pastor Josh, man, I just feel like there's a whole lot of anger in this room tonight. There's a whole lot of bitterness, and we released that. And, and, and people also got ushered into a prophetic call on their life, man. And the last night, we said, hey, that's mine. Somebody say, hey. hey. Somebody say, hey. hey. Somebody say, that's mine. that's mine. Somebody say, that's mine. That's mine. And we declared that we were going to go after the promises that God has for us. But, but, but in, in essence, man, I want to say ever since night one, it was like easy to encounter God, right? Man, like if you were at camp, man, it was easy to encounter God, you know? But, but I found at camp, it's always easy to encounter God. But what about after camp? What, what, what about after camp? Exactly what now? Man, man, what do I do now? You see, there's something about breaking away from the internet, man, breaking away from your cell phone. You know, some of y'all were struggling without that cell phone. Y'all, y'all were like, oh, Josh, please, can I just see your cell phone? I, I, I just want to see what one looks like. I've forgotten. Like, it's been like three hours. You know, something about when you break away from your cell phone, then when you break away from social media, then when you break away from your parents, when you just, just when you break away from society in general, and then you're surrounded by men, 150 other people who are hungry for Jesus, men who are expecting to encounter Jesus, right? Men, it makes it easy to meet with God. It makes it easy. But what about when you get home? See, what about when you get back to school? See, but what about when you get home and your parents are fighting again? See, but what about when you get back to school and that bully that you're dealing with is still there? Can we be real? See, but what about when you get back to school and, and, and that circle of friends from last year comes back? And wants to pull you back in. And you're like, man, I had an encounter with God. I know I shouldn't hang out with you. But I don't know. 
You know, you're kind of freaking out because you don't know what to do. See, what about then and and tonight? That's what I want to talk about. Because when you re-enter the real world after camp, or or better, let me say it this way because I know not everybody went to camp, is that when you re-enter the real world after your encounter with God, if you if if you let it, the environment can stifle the fire that God started in you. It can stifle it, man, it can shut it down. And so tonight, I do not want that to happen. And there's a guy in the Bible that had a camp experience just like we did. Somebody say, his name. Somebody say Moses. Somebody say Moses. Man, if you have your Bibles tonight, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 24, verse 12. Come on. The Bible says this. And the Lord said to Moses, somebody say Moses. He says, come up to me on the mountain. Verse 15. Then Moses climbed up the mountain, and the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, or I, I, I like to say Camp Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud. As he climbed higher up the mountain, he remained on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. Now, get this. All right, how many of you guys have ever seen a mountain in person before? How many of you guys have ever been standing at the base of a mountain before? It is absolutely huge, right? Like you're sitting there, you're like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. And, I, and so, you, so imagine standing at the foot of this mountain, then the whole mountain being covered in fire and in smoke. What? And then imagine seeing this guy named Moses crazy enough to hear the voice of God and to walk into the fire. I'd be like, yo, Moses is crazy. That, that's what happened. But, but, but man, but I think it's fair to say that Moses had an epic encounter with God, right? Right? Talk to me, y'all, right? He had an epic encounter with God. You you, you know, kind of like we did at camp, man. Kind of like we did at camp. Is that obviously, you know, we didn't experience the power and the glory of God on the quite... On the quite the same level as Moses did. But man, but we definitely experienced the power of God. Man, man, man I, I was reading through your guys' testimonies once again, man, about how God changed you and how God transformed you and man, how you were wrecked, man, and how you're never going to be the same again. And, and it's like, man, you encountered God. It, it's that like you had your own Mount Sinai moment, man, where God said, listen, I'm calling you up higher from where you're living at right here. I'm not calling you to stay the same. Is that this is going to be a transformational moment in your life forever. So get up here. And so many of you guys said, man, I'm going up here. Is that I'm going up higher, man. I'm going after Jesus. Amen. Amen. Is that I love it because while on the mountain or while at Camp Sinai, is that you could say, man, that Moses found out his calling. Man, he found out, man, that he was going to take the people into the promised land. Man, he found out instructions on how to build God's house that he wanted. Man, he learned how to worship the right way. It is that there was a new level of leadership and anointed that was imparted to him on the mountaintop. It is that Moses spent 40 days in the presence and the glory of God. 40 days, man. He had this amazing encounter with God. And it left him changed forever. It left him changed forever, man. Like, like, I don't know about you guys, man, but after I have like an amazing encounter with God, I'm on like cloud nine. You know what I'm saying? I'm on cloud nine, man. I'm like, geez, you know what I mean? Like, you're like, yes, God, this is so amazing. You know, you're like, you kind of act kind of drunk almost sometimes. You know, you're like, oh, God, how are you? I don't even know right now. <laughs> Jesus just touched me. Oh, my God. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You, you, you're just so freaked out, man, because it's like, dude, like I just encountered God. And, and, and so, I mean, I, am, I imagine that, I mean, as Moses was, was coming off the mountain after that 40 days, he was on cloud like 2,000. You know what I mean? Because he didn't just encounter a little bit of God, man. He got it all. And so he was on cloud 2,000. But he comes down off the mountain. And... He, he's just like, man, I'm ready for everyone to experience what I just encountered. On cloud 2000, and he comes down, but the truth is, is that he hits real life. 
he hits real life just like we hit real life. Is that that moment, man, where the glory of God was, man, where he could feel the presence of God, man, where he felt the love of God, man, where he saw God's hand, he saw God moving, it was up there, and now he's down here again in real life, in the real world. In the real world. In fact, let's, 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 let's read about it. In fact, no, 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 I'm sorry, we're, we're not going to read about it. It, it, it. I'll tell you guys about it. There you go. Is that, is, is that he entered into a rough environment. He came down to the camp of Israel. Man, in Israel, you want to know what they were doing when they were supposed to be waiting on him? They're supposed to be waiting on him to get instructions for God. And he came down and Israel began worshiping false gods. And the Bible says is that they were getting drunk. Is that they were indulging men in sexual sins. Is that they were indulging men in pagan revelry. Is, is that Moses came off the mountain, his encounter with God to the real world. Somebody say, uh-oh. Somebody say, what now? And, and see, I think that's kind of like us in some ways. You know, man, we come home from camp, man, and we having an amazing encounter with God on Wednesday night, man, and we're psyched and we go to school the next day. Or we get home from camp the next day and, and we hit the real world again and we kind of hit the panic button like, oh God, what do I do now? Like, what do I do now? Oh my, oh my goodness. You, you know, man, I imagine that Moses probably felt intimidated. He probably felt, he's like, man, I'm just one man. I'm just one man, and there's this whole nation that, that, that's not even living or not even acknowledging God right now. How am I supposed to live for God in the midst of this nation that, that has turned their back on God? How am I supposed to do it? How am I supposed to do it? You see, it would be easy for Moses to leave the encounter on the mountain and join in in what everyone else is doing. I'll say that again. So it would be easy to leave the encounter of God on the mountain. You see, you could come home from camp, man, and it would be easy for you to leave the encounter that you had with God at camp. You see, it would be easy, man, is that I know you took that boulder and I know you took that stone. And, man, I know you took that pain and you hurled it, man, but you came back and it would be easy to forget that you cast off that pain away. See, man, I know a lot of you guys, man, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost the first time. And it would be easy for you to leave that experience at camp and not pray in tongues again. When you hit the real world, man, you guys let go of your bitterness and your anger. And it would be easy, man, to come home and to hit real life, man, and, and to forget about what God did in that moment and, and just leave it at camp. But listen, anytime God's move, anytime God moves, it's not, it's not supposed to be um, just, just this thing that happened in history. Man, it's a divine appointment. It is supposed to shift the way that I live. It's supposed to shift the way that I live. Is that God, listen, God didn't touch you so that you could fall out in the Holy Spirit. He didn't touch you so that you could feel the goosebumps. He didn't touch you so you could be all like, oh, this is so amazing. Oh my gosh. That was not his purpose in touching you. Why did God do everything he did in you at camp? Why did he do it? What was his purpose? What was his goal? It's all wrapped up in one word. Somebody say intimacy. Somebody say intimacy. Why did God move, man? Why did God touch you? Man, 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 why did he change your life? It's because he wants intimacy with you. And all of those things were in the way. That pain, that anger, that bitterness... That, that, that resentment, man, it was in the way. And God said, and God said, listen, I got to have more intimacy with you. But in order for me to have it, man, I got to move it out the way. So he didn't move it out the way for you to pick it right back up and put it back in its place. God didn't go, oh, let me move that so I can know. You're like, oh, God, hold on, hold on, I'm back from camp. All right. Listen, if you're in the same place now that you were before you left, 
That's not a good sign. That means you pick something back up and you need to let it go again. See, see, I love it, man. It's because Moses realized that 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 it that it was about intimacy with God. Um, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Exodus chapter thirty-three, verse seven. Basically, Moses comes down off the mountain and he sees Israel sinning, and some stuff happens in between. He rebukes everybody. Um, some people died, whatever. And, 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 and so we pick up here, right? And listen, listen, I love this verse. I love this verse. This is, this is my favorite portion in the Bible. I'm not even sure if I'm doing it justice right now. But it says, this, it says, it was Moses' practice. Somebody say practice. Somebody say practice. To take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance away from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request to the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. Catch this tonight. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind at the tent of meeting. See, Moses understood that it was about intimacy. And this too, Moses understood, man, that one encounter was not going to be enough. Get that tonight. Moses understood that one encounter was not going to be enough. See, your encounter with God at camp was good. Man, it was amazing. He touched you. He changed you. But don't wait till next year to have another encounter with God again. You see, even this man, don't wait till next Wednesday to have another encounter with God. You see, if I am the main source that you get fed from spiritually, then you are in sin. If the church is the main place where you get fed, you're in sin because your player closet should be the main place where you get fed. It should be. You guys got quiet on that one. Listen, but Moses knew, man, that one moment was never going to be enough. See, the tent of meeting, man, it was the place of the presence of God. It was where Moses would go to meet with God. And it was the place, it was the one place where heaven would meet earth. Catch that. This happened nowhere else on earth but in the tent of meeting. It was the one place where the presence of God would come down and speak with man. Or where God would come down and speak with man. See, and I love it, is that in verse 7, it it says, it was Moses' practice. Come on, that's going to preach, man. It was Moses' practice. Somebody say, practice. Practice. See, how many of you guys play sports? How many of you guys play sports in here? How many guys... I mean, how many guys don't play a sport? I see a bunch of, I see some ladies in here. How many of you ladies like to shop? I, I think this will apply to you too in shopping. So, 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 but listen, how many guys know the, 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 the famous saying, practice makes, or is it practice makes? Perfect. My question for you is why do you practice? Why why, why do you practice Kiefer, man? You're super athletic. Why, 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 why do you, he beats me at everything and it kills me, kills me. God. <laughs> bring it in, Josh, bring it in. <laughs> but, 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 man, what is, what, what is the pur- pur- purpose of practicing? Makes me better than the day before. I like it. Come on, so somebody over here, tell me why you practice sports enthusiast to get better to get better okay okay how about this man it, 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 is that all you guys definitely gave the right answer but I, I, I wrote this down is that you practice because you have a goal in mind right and you know that the only way to achieve that goal is through doing something over and over and over again 
Is it, man, I got to do it over and over and over again. Man, if I want to become this kind of basketball player, man, I got, man, I got to go out there and I got to practice over and over and over again. See, my sport in high school was tennis. Man, I love tennis. Like, I was going to be the next Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic. I mean, I was sick. No, nah, I'm just kidding. I wasn't really that good. I thought I was. Um, but dude, I, I remember, man, any spare time I had, any spare time I had, you would see me on the, the tennis courts, man. And, like, it seemed like daily, man, I would at least hit, like, a couple hundred serves. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. Why? Because I had a goal in mind. I had a goal in mind. See, Moses' goal was I have to know God. I have to know God. And the only way that I'm going to know God is I can't just live in the one moment on top of the mountain. That was a good moment, man. That was an amazing moment. But guess what? There's more of God that I need. There's more of God that I have to have. And so I'm going to make it my practice to go and to meet with Him over and over and over and over again. See, this is, this is a part of Christianity that isn't flashy. This is a part of Christianity, man, that's hard and that's tough, man, because it requires discipline and it requires sacrifice. Listen, if you are not willing to discipline yourself, if you are not willing to, offer, to, 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 to have sacrifice in your life, you will not become a man or woman of God. You see, it's going to take you waking up a little extra early in the mornings before school. See, it might take you giving up some free time with your friends. It might take you turning off that Xbox or turning off the cell phone or turning off the TV and says, man, instead of watching this hour of TV, I'm going to go read my Bible. Man, instead of watching this hour of TV, man, I'm going to go and I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. Why though? Because you have a goal. Man, because you understand the heart of God is about intimacy and man, God wants to know you. Man, man, you have a heart to know God too. And Jesus has made this amazing uh, uh, window available. It says, if you seek me, if you draw near to me, I will draw near back. He says, all you got to do is draw near. I mean, all you got to do is draw near. I mean, all you got to do is come in. And I'm going to meet you where you're at. In fact, Moody, can you throw up the verse 11? for me again it says inside the tent of meeting I love this the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to his friend see man I hear that and then something inside me begins to yearn and long because I say man I want God to speak to me like he speaks to, his, to a friend is that man I want to hear the voice of God like that is that, man, I want to get to know God like Moses knew God. Man, man, the life of Moses is my favorite. Man, because did you know, like, God would come to Moses and say, Hey, Moses, I'm thinking about doing this in the earth. What's your opinion? What? Are you kidding? God asked Moses for his opinion? Are you kidding me? Moses was a former murderer. Moses was a former servant. Man, he was, man, he was, a, he was a castaway. He, he, he was a run out. Man, but he understood this. He said, man, I have to get to know God. He says, I got to get to know God. Man, 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 it is my passion. It is a driving force of my life. And so he made it his practice. He said, man, every day I'm going to set up this tent. And I'm going to draw near. I mean, I'm going to begin to meet with God. And I'm going to get to know God. And, and what's our tent of meeting, man? It's our prayer closet. Our tent of meeting is our prayer closet. In fact, can, can, can you guys start Matthew 6, 6 really quick? We're almost done. We're almost done. It says, but when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray... Go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees will reward you. 
well, what will he reward you with himself? See, Moses understood that if he was going to maintain his relationship with God in the midst of a people who were rebellious against the ways of God, he was going to need to spend time with God. See, if we're going to man- maintain the passion and the fire, man, that God put in us at camp, man, you've got to have your own tent of meeting. You've got to have your own tent of meeting. Man, if I can be real with you guys, my wife convicts the mess out of me about this. Man, because there are plenty of mornings where I want to sleep in. Man, there are plenty of mornings, man, where I don't want to pray. Listen, all because you don't want to pray, that doesn't mean you shouldn't pray. All right, and, and, and she'll say, she'll nudge me, babe, what? <laughs> babe, what? Let's pray. Okay, babe, let's do it. Turn on some worship music, and we'll pray. Sometimes she's more into it than I am. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding with you. But, but I think, man, one of the things that keeps that keeps Christians out of the prayer closet the most is that they don't know what to do. Is that they don't know what to do when they don't know how to approach when they don't know what to do while they're in their prayer closet. So if you want to find out what to do in your prayer closet, come back next week. Got him! So really quick, really quick, man, if everyone can close their eyes for me and and may the spirit of shut up come over all of you. <laughs> and everybody can just close their eyes, close their eyes, close their eyes for me. Man, Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Holy Spirit, right now we invite you into this place. Holy Spirit, to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Just, Holy Spirit, come and do what you do. <laughs> You're so good at it. You know, if you're in this place, man, is that we can't leave without giving you a chance to accept Jesus as the Lord of your life. I mean, if you're not right with God right now, if you're not in a relationship with God right now, I want you to know it's not about rules. It's not about a religion. And that God wants to be in a relationship with you. Relationship. That's the whole reason why Jesus came and died. And is that the Bible says is that you were born in sin, separated from God. Is that this thing called sin, man, it was like a, it was like a virus in your blood that, that only Jesus could take away. And the Bible says is that if you die and you don't know Jesus as the Lord of your life, then unfortunately you will go to hell for forever and ever and ever and ever. But Jesus said these amazing words. He says, if you believe in me, Man, if you put your faith in me, man, if you put all your confidence and all your trust in me, man, guess what? You will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. And that everlasting life is a relationship with God that starts right now, today, if you want it. If you'll surrender your life to Jesus, it's the best decision you'll ever make. So if that's you in this place, and you either never prayed the prayer of salvation before, or you once, or, or you had a relationship with God, but now you know you're not right with God, if that's you and you want to get right with God, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hands. One, two, three. Is there anybody in here? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you, I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Ten more seconds. You guys put your hands down if they're already up. Ten more seconds. Come on, don't play with your own eternity tonight. Jesus loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Is there anybody else? Thank you, I see your hand. Is there anybody else? All right, I want everyone to say this with me. I want you to say, God, tonight, before heaven and earth, I ask for the forgiveness of all of my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins and being raised on the third day right now I declare that you are Lord of my life I surrender control I surrender my will and my rights and I give it all to living for and serving you in Jesus name 
Amen, amen, amen. Awesome. And I want to pray one more thing before we head out. Um, you know, I talked about making your prayer closet a practice. And um, I understand that's really easy to preach about and it's a lot harder to do. So I get that. I, I totally understand that. If you're in this place, man, and you say, man, I want the Holy Spirit to help me with making that a practice in my life so that I can get to know Jesus with every eye closed and every head down. So I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray over you. If that's you and you say, man, I want help with that, man, because I need to make that a practice in my life. Jesus, you see every hand that's lifted in this place. Holy Spirit, you want to know them more than they want to know you. So, Father, right now I just ask in the name of Jesus, God, that you would just put such a fire, God, inside of them to get to know you, Holy Spirit. And, Holy Spirit, you would help them, God, discipline themselves to run and to chase after you, God. God, I thank you that, God, as they draw near to you, that you will draw near to them. God, you will draw near to them. God, that their biggest destiny, God, is not to go off and to do something great. God, their biggest destiny, God, is to get to know you. That's what it's about, God. That's what it's about. So, Father, we thank you for that. And we love you. And Holy Spirit, I just thank you that you're helping them draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. I just want to remind you guys really quickly that we have camp shirts on sale out there for $15. Please go and buy like one or a hundred or a thousand, whatever. Um, We need to sell those guys. So we love you guys. We thank you. Next week, bring a friend or 20 friends. Have a great night, guys.